Okay, so in uh, this lecture, we're going to discuss uh, a doll's house um, and specifically the theme of morality and immorality in the play. Um, so I want to look at a couple of different characters. So we're going to compare kind of Krogstad and Nora because once we find out both have committed the same crime of forgery, uh, Krogstad has lost his reputation and he's slowly trying to work his way up again. Uh, to more well, well esteemed and more power and money uh, again. And then Nora is just trying to hold everything together at the same time everything is falling apart around her. Um, so she, Krogstead, has this evidence that she's committed forgery and then she's worried now that uh, Krogstead is going to come forward with this information and she'll be uh, faced with the repercussions um, from that information which may even include her, you know, having to leave her family. Uh, she even contemplates suicide because of this. So there is a lot of uh, questions about what is uh, immoral behavior, what should the punishments be for immor immorality, um, and even how immorality can be inherited. Uh, so that's one of the weird questions that this play brings up is can is there a question of nature and nurture? Is there some sort of ingrained um, trait or quality that passes through from parents to child? Uh, if the parents are immoral people or who lead lifestyles that are full of moral depravity, do the children suffer because of that? And we'll see evidence of that with Dr. Rank because he's kind of um, an example of how that could be possible. Um, but Nora starts to fear from her husband's words that she's going to affect her children negatively uh, because of all her deceitfulness, her secrecy. Uh, even if she had good intentions this whole time to save her husband, she still feels like his judgment, his, his very critical judgment of her morality will be uh, the end of their relationship and even worse than that would have a harmful effect on her children possibly. Uh, so that's what we're going to discuss a little bit more uh, in detail for this section. Robert. Tell me, was it so very wrong what this Krogstar did? He forged signatures. You any idea what that means? Well, mightn't he have done it out of necessity? Yes. Or like so many other people without thinking. I'm not so heartless as to condemn a man absolutely for one single action like that. No, you're not, are you, Tom? Many a man can redeem himself morally if he openly confesses his crime and takes his punishment. Punishment? It's not the path Krogstad took. He got through by tricks and deception. It is that that has broken him morally. person with that sort of thing on his conscience is to lie and dissemble and play the hypocrite at every turn. Even with his own wife. And his own children. The children, that's the most terrible part of all, Nora. Why? Because if you are encircled by stinking lies, it brings infection and the stuff of disease into the whole life of a home. Every breath the children draw in a house like that is filled with the germs of something ugly. You sure? Nora, I've seen it often enough as a lawyer. Nearly all the people who have become corrupted early in life have had mothers who were liars. Why especially mothers? It usually comes from the mothers. Fathers can have a similar effect, of course. Every lawyer knows that perfectly well. And yet year after year in his own home, this croak star has been poisoning his own children with lies and deceit. That is why I call him morally corrupt. That is why you, my sweet little Nora, must promise not to speak on his behalf again. Give me your hand on it. No, no, what is it? Give me your hand. There. It's settled then. I assure you it would have been impossible for me to work with him. 
So in that brief scene, uh, we saw a couple of important quotations in there where Helmer is talking about uh, the nature of immorality and how it affects not just the person who is a liar, but it affects all of their family uh, and could even be inherited by the children. Uh, so he says, just imagine how a man with that sort of guilt in him has to lie and cheat and deceive on all sides, has to wear a mask even with the nearest and dearest he has, even with his own wife and children. So he's describing Krogstad in this uh, scene, but really uh, we as readers know there's a bit of dramatic irony in that we have we can have a little bit more information than Helmer does that this same discussion applies to his wife. Uh, so she can also be understood as uh, having to wear a mask based on all the lies and deception that, sh that she's been sort of trying to hide from her husband. And she's trying to just live uh, under this mask of happiness and, you know, as if everything is just fine on the surface. But underneath it all, there's a lot of uh, anxiety and guilt even um, for committing this uh, whole secret loan business behind her husband's back. And then Helmer says it's, it's enough, this kind of lying or deception. It doesn't just affect that person's life. It's, it's in fact something that the children uh, affects their lives. Um, so he talks about how it's almost like an illness that can be passed on, like germs or something like that. Uh, so... This instills in Nora, after her husband says this, a fear of being around her children. And we'll see that for the rest of the play. She really tries to avoid any contact with the children um, because of what her husband has said in this uh, scene. So she fears that her immorality, her deception, her lies, her secrecy, all of that is going to have a really negative impact on her children. So she's afraid um, that she's going to hurt them in some way or cause them to become immoral or corrupt in later life. Um, but at this early point in the play, uh, we can start thinking about how there are kind of parallels between uh, Nora and Krogstad. Um, so those two characters we know for sure have uh, experienced or have enacted immor immoral deceptions, um, but they were doing it for sort of good reasons, at least that's what we can understand that Nora was trying to help somebody and we'll learn that Krogstad also had a more sympathetic reason for his immoral behavior um, and then at this point the moral characters seem to be Helmer he seems to uphold himself as this moral just fighter you know he's a lawyer and he only takes cases that are uh, you know reputable that aren't going to tarnish his reputation of being illicit or criminal or corrupt uh, so he puts himself on this kind of pedestal of being a very moral person and condemns anybody who uh, does not act within that moral high ground. Uh, so that's part of the reason why his wife cannot reveal this information that she went behind his back to get this loan because that would be a lie and she doesn't want to seem like a liar to her husband. So it's all very... The, the lines between immorality and morality are kind of blurred when you consider how Krogstad and Nora are trying to help others uh, with their actions. If we look at uh, Krogstad's character in a little bit more detail, you can see some parallels again with Nora's character. Uh, he is her antagonist, so he's sort of the villain uh, in most of the play, at least, um, because he is holding this information over her and blackmailing her. Uh, but we do learn that there are, you know, qualities or aspects of his life that make him a lot more complex than just a villain. Um, and in fact, I think we're meant to sort of sympathize with his character's position in life. Uh, we learn that he is a widower with many children, uh, that he's blackmailing Nora in order to keep his job at the bank. And then he wants he, he wants uh, Helmer to actually hire him uh, in a better position. He's been previously acquainted with Mrs. Lind, Christine. Uh, he's old high school friends with Helmer. And this is an, another reason why Helmer wants to sort of suppress him 
from uh, advancing in the company at the bank. He also wants to regain his reputation and financially support his children. This is his motivation uh, to ask Nora to put in a good word for him and uh, he's going to do whatever he can. He's going to fight for his job because it is his way ahead um, in life and to re re repair his uh, broken reputation and also to support his family. And he also had committed forgery and that's how he lost his reputation in the first place. Um, but it turns out he was trying to save his wife's life. So very parallel in terms of his character and Nora's. And then um, we do see how his character is judged by Helmer as being this immoral person. Uh, but Helmer is really blind to the fact that his wife is in the exact same position as this man who he has condemned. Uh, we also are introduced in Act 2 to Professor, or Dr. Rank. Uh, and he's like an older man who's friends with uh, Helmer and Nora. And he is sort of a character who reiterates a theme. So he's kind of there to articulate uh, some larger sort of themes related to uh, immorality. Um, so Dr. Rank is a friend of the family. So it's kind of made clear that Dr. Rank is, suffers from a health condition that is progressing rapidly and he is expecting to die in the imminent future. Um, and he lets Nora know that uh, and sort of promises that during his last days he will, you know, he doesn't want to see Helmer because Helmer can't handle uh, that kind of uh, exposure to sickness, uh, but he wants to sort of come clean to Nora and confess his love to her so that he loves her body and soul and would do anything for her. Um, but he, his uh, illness is a kind of tuberculosis of the spine, which um, he said was sort of genetically inherited from his degenerate father. And his father sounds like he was a kind of... Um, wild man who engaged in kind of promiscuity and gluttony, uh, kind of lived a more wild lifestyle, uh, spending time with a lot of, you know, women and eating all this rich food, and somehow these actions, either from uh, sort of venereal disease or something, caused his son, Dr. Rank, to develop this kind of spinal disease that's going to end up taking his life. So this theme of inheritance or what a father or parents pass down to their children or what a mother passes down to her children, these are kind of um, ideas or a thematic uh, motif, I guess, that would be uh, part of Dr. Rank's character. Uh, he also takes this role of kind of, uh, you know, he's he could be a way out for Nora. She could use him for his wealth uh, if she chose to ask him for money. And it might surprise some that she would ask, uh, she wouldn't have asked Dr. Rank for the money in the first place. Instead, she asks Krogstad, but being a family friend, it's Perhaps she didn't want to um, compromise that relationship with Rank uh, to get money for Helmer. Uh, but he does. He said he would give her anything and do anything uh, for Nora. And uh, she could almost use him as a kind of scapegoat if she needed it to, uh, to get out of all this uh, business with Krogstad. Uh, but she doesn't because... Um, she, she doesn't want anybody else to take the fall for her. She believes this is her responsibility and she's going to do uh, everything that she can to fix it herself. So she's also becoming a little bit more self-aware of her actions and the responsibility that's falling on her shoulders uh, in relationship to her choices in life. Uh, but Dr. Rank is sort of there in the shadows. He could be a kind of uh, figure who she, who could sort of come out of nowhere and just save her, rescue her, 
uh, in the, her time of need, but it's not what she wants. Uh, and it's, if you remember back to Act 1, she does have this kind of fantasy of an older man who just leaves all his money to her in, a, in her will. Uh, and Christine, actually, Mrs. Lind, thinks that uh, Dr. Rank is that man uh, in Nora's life who would do such a thing for her. Uh, but it turns out that she's Nora doesn't want his help uh, in trying to get out of this very difficult situation with the money. Torvald uh, is also sort of concerned with uh, his reputation as a very morally upright individual. Uh, so he considers himself a very moral man and when he was a lawyer he only took cases that were what he called clean and decent uh, so cases that wouldn't you know make him have to defend people who were criminals or were corrupt um, so he sees himself as sort of above anybody who lies or who's deceitful and he although he was friends with Krogstad in their younger days he now is repulsed by Krogstad and sees him as very morally degenerate he doesn't even want him in the bank, um, but he at some point does say he could look past the immorality of Krogstad, but there's other things, other reasons why he doesn't want to have Krogstad in the office, and it's a much more petty reason than his criminal past. It just has to do with the fact that Krogstad doesn't sort of... Uh, treat Torvald as an authority figure. He calls him by his first name and is sort of chummy with him. Uh, so there is a kind of ego or narcissism as well as part of Torvald's uh, sense of morality or his his reputation. Um, so he uh, is concerned very much about his status or reputation. He doesn't want to be tainted by any corruption and he really wants to protect his uh, reputation amongst the, the people at the bank. Uh, so he, want, he doesn't want to have his power uh, questioned. Uh, so we're going to look at a, a, a scene where uh, Torvald explains why Krogstad shouldn't be uh, hired at, or shouldn't keep his job at the bank. And this sort of explains some of the petty reasons that motivate Helmer. Uh, based on his sort of masculine pride and reputation. Just because you go and make some thoughtless promise to put in a good word for him, you no, expect no, it's me not that, Torvald, Torvald, it's not that, it's for your own sake. The man writes in the most horrible newspapers, you've said so yourself. He could do you unspeakable harm. He frightens me to death. I understand. Is it old memories that have frightened you? What? But what do you mean? You're thinking of your father, naturally. Yes, do you remember what malicious people wrote in the papers about Papa, how they slandered him so terribly? I think, you know, they'd have got him dismissed if the Ministry hadn't sent you there to investigate if you hadn't been so kind and My wonderful. dear Nora, there is a considerable difference between your father and me. Your father did not hold a position that demanded he was unimpeachable, but I do. And I intend to remain that way for as long as I hold my post. Well, yeah, but no one knows what evil people can come up with. You see, we could live so peacefully, happily, you and I and the children, the peace and quiet of our own home without a care in the world. That's why I implore you. But it is precisely by pleading for him that you make it impossible for me to keep him. It is already known in the bank that I intend to dismiss Krogstad. If the rumor got round, the new bank manager had let his wife change his mind. Well, what if it did? Oh, of course. Now, as long as the obstinate little thing gets her own way, I should go and make myself look ridiculous in front of the whole staff. Give people the idea that I'm not my own man? I should soon suffer the consequences of that, shouldn't I? Besides, there is one other consideration that makes it completely impossible for me to have Krogstad at the bank as long as I'm manager. What's that? His moral failings I might have overlooked if absolutely necessary. Yes, you could, couldn't you, Torvald? Yes, and I hear he's quite useful too. But he was an acquaintance of mine when we were young. It was one of those rash friendships that you're so often embarrassed by in later life. Well, I may as well tell you straight out. We've always called each other by our Christian name. 
And this tactless person makes no attempt to hide it when other people are present. On the contrary, he thinks this entitles him to adopt a familiar tone with me. So at every opportunity, he blurts out his poor thought this and his poor thought that. I find it highly embarrassing. He would make my position at the bank intolerable. You don't mean all this. Oh? Don't I? Why not? Well, no, because this is all so small-minded. What do you mean? Small-minded? Well, you think I'm small-minded? Well, no, no. On the contrary, to about... Oh.